All right, Brittany, I'm really excited to kind of dive into this topic with you because you're my go-to. I mean, I even sometimes I, I just don't know the lingo that you know, that's involved with like at the, the CrossFit box or, you know, like some of the, the terminology you use. So I really appreciate you helping me out with this one. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, I, I talk a lot about care for pregnant and postpartum women and just helping them navigate these crazy changes that happen to us during pregnancy, the event that is birth, and then how to get back to different sport and activity postpartum. And I mean, as we all know, as we all know, as therapists, you see such a difference. You see on one end of the spectrum, women who feel that lack of guidance is paralyzing. Like, oh my gosh, I I don't want to do anything. I don't know what I should do. Maybe I should just rest more or I can't do that anymore. But then you also see this on the other end of the spectrum, women that are like pedal to the metal. It's like, wow, like I was given all clear at at six weeks postpartum and I feel great. And I am so excited to get back to CrossFit or weightlifting because that makes me tick. Right. And so Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about the, um, you know, a special group of women here. And I thought we could go over special considerations for women that participate in the same sport and activity that you do CrossFit and weightlifting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to the chat. (laughs) Yeah. I thought we would leave it really open. And I wanted to just kind of say to you, I think we'll cover a lot of the questions that people have. If I just say to you, can you tell me what are three things, you know, women that are listening to this, that, that participate in CrossFit or weightlifting, um, get a lot of mixed messages during Mm -hmm. pregnancy and a lot of holes in, in information. And so if I said to you, what are three things that you want these pregnant women to hear, what would they be? Oh, Good question. Um, I would say probably the first and foremost is to have them understand of what they're looking for or watching for or listening for. Um, because often you get the, the narrative of, well, just listen to your body and you'll know what is appropriate. And sure, that's all well and good. But if, if you think of what we're currently living in, we're also very good at blocking things out and ignoring signals from our body. So when it comes to this demographic, you know, I I always do a lot of education around awareness of if they're starting to experience any low back pain or pelvic girdle pain or uh, heaviness, feeling of heaviness at the vagina, any discomfort at the abdominal wall, um, any leaking of urine, like all those indicators that would be like their little warning shot that their body isn't tolerating what you are throwing at it, so to speak. And I think first and foremost, that's important for them to understand, um, is particularly when we're dealing with the, the athlete brain, right? So we are really good at kind of pushing through and especially with that CrossFit demographic, it's that's what the workouts are about, <laughs> is pushing through discomfort, so to speak. And so helping them first understand like, what is okay discomfort at this stage and what is not um, is really important for that group. Number two would be- Well, one second, I have, I wanna ask you more about that one first. Okay. Because would you say then that, what do you think? Like, I know it's different for everybody, but what do you think when they're experiencing those symptoms? Like if they're leaking during pregnancy or if they're having back pain or what, what do you think that, they take out of that? What do they believe that it's just, it's just, I have to push through it so that I stay strong in my pregnancy or what are they getting out of that? Well, I don't know if, you know, potentially these individuals, that might be something that they're used to doing pre-pregnancy. So if that was something, maybe you push through pre-pregnancy, how would it be known that it should be any different now? Um, so I think that's one variable to consider Mm -hmm. with them. Um, I also think helping them understand like the physiological changes that are occurring in their body and, and why we would be maybe considering making alterations to their, their 
program or the types of exercises they're doing is, is also important. Like I think bottom line, setting real setting expectations for this demographic because they're a very motivated crowd. And if they understand the root why, um, it's easier for them to have buy-in through that process. Totally. I One of the things I say to like every single pregnant client, and I always say, you know, think of your pregnant body, like a friend in need. There's just, it's changing. And so I wonder, all right, I'm guessing some of these women seek out your help during pregnancy. And so I wonder if you just in a nutshell, talk about like, if we, if your number one point was like, learn to listen, learn to listen to your body or learn to watch what to watch out for. Do you spend time then explaining to them, you know, what changes happen with their muscles? Like, maybe talk a little bit about what is that education look like for them about the anatomy? Like, what are some things you want them to know about the changes? Right. So things that I start to explain is obviously as the baby grows and we are gaining weight our, and our baby belly starts to grow, we have changes to that deep anchor of our, of our body, our abdominal wall and those muscles at the front of our abdomen all become lengthened, which increasingly will put us at a disadvantage for being able to access them to stabilize. The pelvic floor has a new and ever-changing demand, and it often is just trying to hang on through those changes, especially if we throw a lot of complex skills like moving heavy load or doing things with high coordination and high impact can present an increased challenge to those muscles. Um, The increased lordosis can present challenges to women during certain skills like dumbbell snatches or overhead positioning. Um, They might start to experience back pain. Um, And then with the like gymnastics type skills that are very high load to the abdominal wall, then I explain like why we will be making changes away from the more dynamic, like kipping movements on the rig as their belly starts to grow. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like, it's just like making that connection, right? If they understand what, what ch- changes are happening in their body, they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Why I wouldn't, why that skill would maybe not be as great for me if, if my body is starting to give me those warning signs. Totally. And I think exactly education is kind of the, I find one of the biggest components because otherwise, (laughs) like you said, if you're already used to pushing through, you know, you just understand this time around, I mean, there's, there's changes to the body and you know, it's, it's expected and that this is why you're feeling what you're feeling. And I think everyone wants to take care of their body and their baby the best they can. And I agree. As soon as you explain it, it's like, Oh, you're not necessarily going to get resistance. Right. And I think a lot of times we think that, Oh, I don't want to piss them off by telling them this. No, if anything, they're like, thank you for explaining this. No one has explained this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's, I think it's hard to give like specific examples because as you well know, every pregnancy, every pregnant body is so unique. And I have individuals who feel quite comfortable um, skipping till like later in their pregnancy, whereas some want to discontinue like early on in the first trimester, just because it doesn't feel right. Yeah. Exactly. And exactly. Yeah. I think learn, learn how to navigate your own body is really important or understand your own body. Right. Um, you started to say that your number two point was breathe through exercise. Mm. So breathe through exercise. And this is a big one. And, and one that I do um, advocate for quite strongly, just because of the, the evidence um, that it can have on the, the effect on fetal heart rate and fetal blood flow. Um, when we use the high pressurized kind of stabilization strategies of either using a, um, a Valsalva, which is to like fill the lungs with air, close off the glottis to increase pressure, which will increase spinal stability. And then kind of another step beyond that would be using a Valsalva plus adding a weightlifting belt, which that's kind of intuitive. Like most, once the baby bump starts growing, it's not the most comfortable thing to want to be using anyways. Um, so breathing through exercise and, and often this is a t- period of time that I, I cue that, you know, exhale on exertion concept, because then we're naturally helping <clears throat> ourselves utilize our deep anchor, mm-hmm. um, through 
modulation of of the breath mechanics. So basically, like learn how to exaggerate some of the muscles that are already helping you, but because your body's changing, learn how to kind of call on everything that you can. That's yeah, that's right. In a way that you're managing pressure. Well, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So that would be like an overarching number two. <laughs> what about number three? Oh, well, I think number three, and again, this comes down to um, managing expectations and, and that education piece is basically if we think of it as a gradual deconditioning pro- process. So the, your, um, perceived exertion will likely stay the same throughout. However, your complexity of the skill, the load that you're moving, the speed at which you're moving, the range of motion you're moving through, just think of all of those things gradually reducing as the pregnancy progresses. Um, And again, it's kind of one of those things is, is if we set that that expectation of now is not the time to be you know getting pr lifts making pr lifts um but if i understand a a way that i can continue to exercise safely that's going to feel just as challenging in the end um there there usually like you said is not a lot of resistance to that because i think otherwise sorry to interrupt go ahead Yeah, I I was just going to use an example as well of thinking like high impact is something that generally as pregnancy progresses is just becomes more uncomfortable and less desirable to continue with. And so if I have an example of a box, um, a very common exercise found in CrossFit programming, that box jump could turn into a either a lower box or a step up and then as that becomes more challenging or as your hip range of motion starts to change because the ba- the belly is in the way, reducing the height of the box. And that's kind of like a, a, that gradual deconditioning or a gradual um, reduction in complexity of the skill. Totally, which is like understandable. And I think it, that applies across the board with any activity, right. During pregnancy, like just right. again, looking yeah. at the changes to the body, this isn't, this isn't, Oh shoot, you do CrossFit, then you can do less. Like that's gonna, that's gonna you apply to runners. That's going to apply to swimmers. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's going to apply to everybody. And I think just sometimes, I think that sometimes social media or, you know, different images portray like to stay fit. And I mean, stay fit, of course, but that, you know, you need to maintain and, you know, you're, you're kind of being lazy if you don't go more in order to achieve the same, you know what I mean? And so I think, yeah, again, it's a really important thing for women to hear because, because of just respecting everything that's going on. Right. Yeah. And I, I think there are some unique, um, unique considerations that I do go delve into specifically when people are curious um, and depending on the type of athlete. So some unique considerations with CrossFit athletes or weightlifters is um, one exercise in particular, like called, it's called the snatch. We have impact, we make contact with the bar at the pelvis. So that is something to consider, obviously, beyond 14 weeks when baby starts to exit the pelvis. And we, I would suggest, depending on the level of the athlete, maybe modifying away from the snatch when the bar path starts getting impacted by that baby bump, just so we're not um, training bad habits. I, f- I feel like coming out of that postpartum if you're trying to retrain an altered movement pattern that you've you've gotten into from kind of looping around the belly when normally you want the bar path to be straight up, um, that's one alteration that's unique to that crowd that I would talk to specifically. Um, With the clean, that, that change usually requires being made later because um, the contact at the thigh is a little bit lower than the contact at the, at the pelvis with the snatch. Um, and 
things like burpees, you know, same, same type of timeline, but different rationale that belly coming down in contact with the floor would be uncomfortable, or maybe we would exercise caution around that. And you can alter the burpee to a number of different variations. They kind of are endless but basically doing a top end burpee or elevating your, your hands um, or whatever that might be so that you're not going right down to the floor. And I think that you've kind of answered this um, to me, you have, but I know one of the questions that a lot of women ask are, okay, so tell me the good exercises and the bad exercises. Like just tell me CrossFit good and bad. And I think, um, and I want you to elaborate this on this, but I think basically what your answer is going to be is that, I mean, that depends on the person that's in front of me. That depends on, you know, what you look like and what your symptoms are and what you're telling me and how you're doing that. Because it's not like you just told you didn't, you didn't just say those exercises are bad, but you would educate again on this is why you're, you, you'd have to either modify or let's just leave that one for now and, and come back to it later when your body shape is different or right. Right. Yeah. So anything else, like when people, if people ask you, okay, so Mm -hmm. tell me what's good and bad, anything else to elaborate on that? Um, no, I think it's no different than what you just described. It's, it's always a, it depends. Mm -hmm. Um, because the, I, the literature even supports that, right? When mm-hmm. we think about it, some people have greater increases in intra-abdominal pressure just getting up out of a chair versus doing a sit-up. And so it's always, uh, if I have eyes on you, it's like, show me, show me what you want to do and mm-hmm. let's troubleshoot this. Mm-hmm. Um, because nine times out of 10, I do find coaching an individual um, with, with subtle strategy modifications or um cues can be tremendously impactful and if it's if we tinker with a few things and it's still a no-go then it's like well maybe this is an exercise that isn't appropriate for you right now but um i'm really trying to be cautious around using blanket statements of Mm -hmm. These are the modifications you must make during pregnancy because it's, it's highly individual. (laughs) I'm curious to know, um, just because again, this isn't my sport. How often do you see women, you know, stay at the gym lifting heavy or in the CrossFit box, like up until birth time? Mm, Good question. Well, this is a really interesting time to ask that because gyms are closed Uh, here here in in here in Nova Scotia unfortunately right now um but it really depends on the individual I've definitely treated a couple of of elite athletes that continued to stay right up into the end um but their exercise was really pretty um tailored at that point you know they might be cycling on the bike They might be doing some squats to a box, basically moving their body weight or maybe some lighter dumbbells um, were, was sufficient. Um, And, but, but most towards the end are experiencing a lot of fatigue and just kind of hit that point where they're like, yeah, I realized that I'm kind of done for now. Absolutely. What, okay. So I'd, I'd say that's probably our general population, right? Yeah. Absolutely. We'll always have the, the, the outliers. Absolutely. Yeah. What about, let's take it right to, um, so mom has her baby and mm-hmm. she's obviously keen to get back. When do you tend to see them return to the gym or the CrossFit box? Great question. Um, I would say here, uh, in Nova Scotia, typically I don't see people attempting until they get their green light from their healthcare provider. Mm-hmm. Um, and at, at that stage, if I have the opportunity to work with them again, we, we're almost like going back to the education piece that we did in pregnancy and doing a lot of education again, about the rationale of, of, of why we would maybe consider like certain strategy, uh, as far as returning back to fitness. Um, because I, I generally like to use the education that, you know, your primary healthcare provider is looking for certain things at that six weeks. And 
I, a pelvic health physio or an orthopedic and pelvic health physio, um, I would look at things from a, sli- from a different lens. And, um, you know, overall strength and control and activation and ability to control their, their body in space um, would be what I look for in that beginning. So obviously um, that education piece is the, the first starting place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know you use this line a lot, Mel, but like do, advocating for, for the narrative to change a little bit of like, why are we not treating this as a musculoskeletal injury? Mm-hmm. Just like other injuries in the body, right? Like if we have a sprained ACL, then we treat it a certain way. And for, for some reason, the pelvic floor has not been managed with that. Mm-hmm. And I, I explain it from that light, like we want to start with range of motion and that gentle connection and um, reconnecting with that deep anchor in particular, because that's what is serves that stability for our trunk and our pelvis and um, control of <laughs> bowel and bladder. And let's see what your control is like in a kind of a supported position and then progressively increasing the challenge. So exactly, exactly how we look at other injuries. And I, I wonder if I, cause I'm going to stick you to the same thing. Tell me three things that you want postpartum women to know this from this demographic. And so I'm guessing like, that's one of them, right. That, that you just want them to understand what their body's been through and, mm-hmm. and that there's progression because yeah, I mean, we, I, th- I often use this. I was just putting a presentation together the other day and I showed like, what does that look like for a, a broken leg? Like just people understand like, okay, I break my leg, I rest it. And then there's a progression. So mm-hmm. yeah. Do you want to kind of talk about how then you explain that to your, to this, to the, your clients? Right. Um, basically I start there. Like I, I, I'd use an analogy to another body part that they can easily relate to and explain, well, we, we start with swelling management and we start with range of motion. We start with range of motion in easier positions and then gradually get to more challenging positions. Um, and then we like ask our body to like control its own body weight through space. And then we start, start to think about adding range of motion and then we add load and then we add speed. So it's almost, you can think of it as just a reverse of what we work through, through pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have, you know, some specific, uh, right, wrong, or different. I'm just starting to develop my own little kind of protocol with this group in, in the sense of, let's give them challenging things that look like the thing they want to do, but isn't exposing them to the velocity of the movement or those variables that make it trickier for them to um, stay connected with that deep system while they're moving. And often there's uh, a lot of, it's easy buy-in at that point, because really I I have them hold say a split squat in an isometric hold and at 20 or 30 seconds, they're sweating and shaking and they haven't moved, but they're feeling the activation in all the right parts. They can still feel that connection with the deep system and breathe. And then it's like, okay, well, this looks like our, our lunge that you might want to get back to or a walking lunge. Um, It's just right now we're maintaining a static position. So you have the ability to, to own that, right? Um, so that's, that's how I explain it. And often once we get started, it's like, oh yeah, like this is easy. And, and then we talk about the specifics of, okay, when you're going back to your, the next wad, like these would be modifications to consider. And I do help provide a lot of guidance there. Coaches are generally, um, really good at understanding modifications of the exercises, right. For giving an easier version of. And I'm using my hands, but you can't see that (laughs) an easier version of, and they understand that often around um, if someone has pain or someone just 
maybe is um, physically not capable of doing that. It's just sometimes with the, the postpartum mom, maybe they physically can do the, the skill, but is it necessarily appropriate for them at that stage? And so if they understand those modifications and the coaches involved, then it's really a, it's quite a streamlined process, actually. Absolutely. I, th- I agree all the time. I mean, I think that when, you know, for some reason we look at the postpartum body very differently and, and I don't, I think that will, that's obviously already changing and it'll increase as increased awareness happens. People mm-hmm. get it more because as soon as you do explain like another injury, I, I always ask, have you had another injury? And we talk about the progression that they had and all of a sudden they're like, Oh, duh, I get that. I have to do the same thing. The muscles that were affected though, you know, during my pregnancy or my birth are just different muscles that have embarrassing symptoms or, you know, that do, do, and also that have such an automatic job. I mean, these muscles are not muscles we're used to thinking about because they provide this anchor that you talk about without awareness. And so you're trying Mm -hmm. to all of a sudden rehab muscles that you're not used to thinking about and tie them into the body in the complex movement. And so I agree. I think as soon as you break it down and explain it, they're like, I get it. I need to be able to yeah. move my foot before I stand on it, or I need to be able to stand on it before I jump on it. And right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's- yeah. And that's, that would be like our overarching number one. I feel like we're still rambling about number one, but that's, that's what I would say to them is exactly approach it. Like you would another injury. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Number two. <laughs> um, number two is watch for breath holding patterns with early return to fitness. Cause w- what I find typically when I'm seeing women that are maybe later postpartum that are now struggling with, with injury or struggling with pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, Will you is, list some of is, those things, Brittany, like list some of those things that these women are experiencing. Um, well, certainly I would say like symptoms of loss of urine, right involuntary loss of urine, common activities that that would occur occur with in this group would be box jumps, double unders. I think double unders, that is the highest incidence of occurrence. Um, Box jumps is number two. And then we've got heavy um, deadlifts and cleans, which makes sense because it's like the heaviest load that you're going to be moving as well. Um, Feeling of pressure or heaviness at the the perineum or the vagina. Also loss of control of gas in all of those same scenarios of exercises that I've described above. Experiencing hip pain, pelvic pain, pubic pain, um, and noticing coning or doming at their abdomen with, with abdominal wall type challenges in CrossFit, that would be a lot of the gymnastics type skills where you're on the rig doing either pull-ups, kipping pull-ups, um, bar muscle ups, those types of skills. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would be my 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 main ones. Tailbone pain too, if I hadn't mentioned that. Okay, and so we, they come to you describing these symptoms, and then mm-hmm. when you were talking about breath holding. Breath holding. Well, I just what I find is when people return to activities that are a little bit too challenging for what the, what they can stabilize their trunk for um, in that early process, the easiest way for us to do that is to increase spinal stiffness through like a breath hold. And so I think moms, I think I've heard you use this analogy, Mel, which I really like is that early pregnancy. It's like, it's like popping a balloon. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, all of that, that stretch and feedback that we've had from the baby being there is gone. Mm -hmm. And, and women often feel very lost through their midline. And especially in those skills that are, um, they're exposing themselves to in CrossFit, uh, that demand of a lot of that trunk stability, a breath hold is an easy way for them to try and continue to get through it, Mm -hmm. but not necessarily in an, in an efficient way. Mm -hmm. So I would say later on when I'm seeing these moms, those would be a, uh, one of the variables that I would tinker with, those high tension strategies that they're really using a lot of pressure um, and often tweaking that 
can often alleviate a lot of symptoms that they're having. And just to clarify, because I think that there's a message out there that like Valsalva and a breath hold is always bad, mm. but just to be clear, like that's something that you would like, you would work them up to correct. You're just saying <laughs> in the early, in the early phases, it's not the best place to start. It's just like doing a, it's just like j- jumping before, you know, you're just trying to, like you said, pick the, pick the path of least resistance initially, and then progress the activity. Correct. That That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so that that Valsalva just it exponentially increases intra-abdominal pressure and the path of least resistance will become the, the symptom that presents itself. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely an advocate that these athletes that are in strength sports, CrossFit and weightlifting, they absolutely have to get back to a Valsalva. Mm-hmm. So it's not a fair narrative that these women are hearing if they seek information elsewhere, even before they come to see me. Um, I actually recently had a power lifter that was having um, a lot of pelvic pain and had saw someone else and had great, like great recommendations and had made progress, but she's, she felt very lost because she's like, well, how do I ever back squat (laughs) again? If I can't Valsalva, because in theory above about 75 to 85% of someone's one rep max as far as their lift ability, we have to use a Valsalva. And I think this is maybe a little bit of a coaching discrepancy. Like all the literature is done on men. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really easy from a coaching perspective to say like, push out into that belt, like fill up, fill up the lungs. And I I think women um, are, just naturally using like a bearing down type strategy rather than calling on that deep system as your primary anchor first, like your natural belt, <laughs> like your, your natural built in belt. belt. Yeah. Your built built in belt, calling that on first, then using a, an, a, a weightlifting belt if we're getting to that stage. That's like the end end stage on top of our Valsalva. But what I see more times than not is you have an athlete without a belt, maybe they're working up to using a good bracing strategy. And then they, they put the belt on and their bracing strategy completely changes. Mm. And that's also not how we should be doing it. The brace, the bracing strategy should be the same. It's just the resistance of the belt should add that additional 10% of pressure. Um, when we, when we use it in theory. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. What, yeah. What's number three, Brent? Oh goodness. Number three, uh, with the, with the athletes in mind, I would in postpartum, I would say establish realistic expectations. So if they understand timelines of, okay, it is going to be maybe nine to uh, 12 months before I am expecting to be lifting my one RM attempts again, That is a narrative that an athlete brain can work with because they have a timeline and they can take that more gradual approach to return to those exercises um, than not. I think with this demographic that is highly, highly, highly motivated, you know, it's just like having a marathon runner wanting to return. They always have a plan, you know? Totally. They don't think, just go out and run a marathon the next day. They, they have that training plan to get back and gradual increase in mileage. And I think returning to CrossFit and weightlifting needs to be viewed the same. And as if you have a good coach, then that, that naturally will be periodized and programmed for you. Um, certainly I can dive deep into specifics. Um, I, I always call on the guidance of my personal weightlifting coach as well, Isaac Smith, when I'm stumped as to what are appropriate like modifications or um, changes as well in this demographic, if it's weightlifting specific or even CrossFit specific. Um, Because that's something that you do, right? Like you, I know that like through mommy berries, I know you help me out with online appointments. And especially when anyone reaches out to me that, that is from this demographic, I send them to you. So I know you see, um, you know, 
clients one-to-one through online appointments. Is that something you do with coaches too? You know, anyone that wants to know more about how to support their female athletes? I absolutely would. Yes. Uh, It isn't something that has, has occurred per se. Uh, I recently had one of the CrossFit gyms here in Halifax, North Endurance, uh, reached out to me and asked to asked if I would do a pelvic health info session. And uh, I think we had about 17, oh. 17 people, including coaches. So I think two, two of the key coaches were present, which is amazing. Um, and another gym's expressed interest. So yes, I, it's something that I would, I'm, I love to t- chat about. It's a good idea um, to kind of um, like prepare it for the whole gym, right? Because, you know, then you can kind of speak to everybody. Everyone's on the yeah. same page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it was fun. I think people are always surprised that it's about much more than the pelvic floor. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. And I feel like it, I'll make sure that I link all of that and how to contact you in the show notes. But I think that uh, like, just, I can, I'm always trying to listen to this as if I'm a person listening to this from the outside. And I think like, I think you do such a good job of taking away so much of the fear. It's not it's not like they're listening to this thinking, okay, now I know what exercises to do. I know what week I need to modify this. Like, that's not the answer. There's no recipes, but, but just understanding, you know, like the, I guess I'm almost like the regression of the body or the changes to the body during pregnancy. And then I always picture like a downhill, I just, I draw like almost like a downhill for people during pregnancy. And then I show that the uphill comes after, but right. that that's specific to the individual. And just, you do such a good job of taking away the fear because, um, I think that there's certain activities that women hear, well, I need to get in my CrossFit fix before I have a baby, because I'll have to say goodbye to that after, or do you know what I mean? Like I'll never be the same after. And so I think, you know, just helping women understand that there's support out there and you can still do the activities that you love, but just understanding, yeah, you do have a different body for a while, right? Right. Maybe forever. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's, I think. I think, you know, especially within CrossFit, the community is huge, right? That sense of community. And so if people understand that they can still go to class and maybe there are changes that need to be made for them individually, and they, but as long as they know what those things are um, and they can still be part of the community, they are very happy, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and with the ultimate goal of, yeah, if your attempt is to get back on the rig and to do a kipping pull up without doming, then, you know, we will try our darndest to have that happen. I think it's, you know, under meeting the, meeting the athletes where they're at, um, and really helping them, helping empower them to maybe I'll step up back one, one step, but providing them with the information evidence-informed information, and then letting them ultimately come to the decision on their own. Mm -hmm. And I I do think that's where the the empowerment comes from, because unfortunately, what I'm trying to be much more aware of as a clinician these days is the impact of words, and Mm. especially with social media and the fear-mongering that's out there, (laughs) um, and the do's and don'ts, and it's a it's an interesting time. I just want them to understand like, yeah, what is their body going through? What, what are the potential implications of their decision? And then ultimately leave them to that decision to be made. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And, and often, you know, they, they know exactly once they understand the rationale, it's, I think it's, I've, I've, I have never met resistance with, you know, what we chat about. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, well, I actually had this client that comes to mind one time. I'll never forget. It was early on when I was practicing and she came in, she was, I want to say she was a CrossFit athlete and she was really newly postpartum and she was motivated to lose weight for her wedding. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was leaking horrendously and obviously very embarrassed about it. And I remember her telling me what she was doing. She was doing a lot of jumping and impact activities and lifting heavy weights. And I remember saying like, Oh, 
don't do that yet or something like that. Like not in a mean mm-hmm. way, but I remember saying like, almost like I was shaming her for what she was doing and she never mm-hmm. came back. Well, no wonder she didn't come back. I approached it all wrong. And I think, I think again, like if that, if I would have educated her first and explained without saying just exactly, she will read between the lines. I just need to explain to her. And then it's up to her because at the end of the day, we're there to support the client and meet them where they're at. But yeah, yeah, I I just started it off on the wrong note. And and that all that time always speaks to me. I will, I almost feel embarrassed about it. I mean, I was early in my practice, but um, I think we do that a lot is they think that they're going to come to us and get a lecture. Right. But I think a good, a good therapist or coach that you work with will meet you where you're at and you should always feel supported in in your decisions. Right. Educated and informed, um, but supported. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, I think, where, you know, your passion lies and my passion lies is just to help fill those holes yeah. with this demographic. Because I, I just think there's so much stigma and um, poor information and lack of resources for this demographic mm-hmm. in that they do, you know, the, the common theme is six weeks postpartum check, green light. You can return to all the things that you used to do. But, you know, we don't, we didn't really consider like all those changes our body just went through, whatever type of injury occurred during um, labor and delivery and the amount of time that your body kind of deconditioned gradually. Totally. Um, Yeah. And that's why I, just to kind of tie it up, I mean, I, um, that's why I created this, the online program from mommy berries to help people navigate the changes their body goes through during pregnancy, their own, like, it's definitely not, this is exactly what's going on with everybody, but I, I educate, and then they are supposed to take that and apply that to their body and know how to, you know, navigate exercise or prepare for their birth and then walks you through those early stages postpartum, you know, with the goal Mm -hmm. that when you get that green light, you're ready for more. And I would absolutely say that that should be supplemented with seeing someone one-on-one so that you have that information, you have that education, and then you see someone that can assess you and help you apply, you know, what you need for your body and get back to your activity of choice. And I think, you know, obviously you've played a huge role in helping me put together that program and and is involved in multiple modules, but um, also too, there's a special section at the end that talks, you have a special message for this demographic. And I just want to point out again, that you are always supporting people one-on-one through online appointment. And I'll make sure I link all of that in the show notes. Any last messages, Britt? Oh man, <laughs> I feel like put on the spot just after that long conversation. I, I don't know. I would say like, reach out, you know, um, you're, I, my final message would be, you're not alone. Um, so many women probably have the same questions, um, the same wonderings and just to break the stigma that you know, those, those embarrassing symptoms in CrossFit postpartum are just not, and they are not just a normal byproduct of having children and being postpartum and, and that you can exercise, um, pain-free leak-free. It just, you know, we have to meet you where you're at. Totally. I'm going to stop you right there. I like that.